And now we're pleased to present the view from the hill. Hill holiday, that is. Please welcome Karen Kaplan, Chairman and CEO of Hill Holiday. Susan Esper, Audit Partner at Deloitte. Marianne Harrison, President and CEO of John Hancock. Marion Hurd, President and CEO of Oxen Hill Partners. Rosabeth Moss Cantor, author and Ernest L. Arbuckle Professor at Harvard Business School. And Kim Sinatra, EVP and General Counsel for Wynn Resorts. Do you see everybody okay, Patrick? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited. Like Your meeting is this. <laughs> All right. This is a great room. Hey, everybody. Everybody feeling good? Great day so far, yeah? Okay. Well, we're going to start off. There's going to be a little freewheeling conversation. Um, we're going to start off by talking about the marches this weekend. Um, because it's very topical. And as I mentioned backstage, um, we're not going to discuss our positions on gun control and gun rights as much as we want to talk about the ability of the Parkland survivors and Gen X in general to really mobilize and to control the conversation and to hold the country's attention in ways that other movements haven't been able to do that. So, Marion, do you mind starting us off and telling us what you I'd think I'd be happy that? to. I'm just going to smile. The picture. <laughs> 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 we want a good shot. We never know where it's going these days. <laughs> the marches were incredible. These young people got, did they get it together? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and here in Boston and in other places, they pre-registered to vote. They got people concerned, organized, and focused. So we wish them well. We're all of an age where this is absolutely exciting. And so I think that the marches told us that young people can organize, they can work together, they can have a focus and a purpose, and they get it done. You know, though, everybody up here is a strategist, but strategy is always trumped, no pun intended, <laughs> by implementation. You gotta get it done. So Karen, they got it done. They got it done. They got it done. Yeah, and Rosabeth, you've seen generations of, your students are a little bit older, but you've seen generations come through. What do you, what do you think about this generation? I, I loved their use of social media. I loved their collaborative spirit that they were all going to support one another and find some principles and use it. And one of the things I loved the most about this is these are high school students who survived something incredibly traumatic, tragic, horrible, and yet they're refusing to be victims. And I think that's an incredible lesson for all of us. You don't, you don't have to be a victim. You can, you can suffer, but you speak up and you do something with it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's a huge difference that's applicable to a number of different topics that we can talk about. And the issue is they will not be silenced. And we talked a little bit about this is a particular moment that women are having in our country today where women will not be silenced. I don't know if Susan, you have uh, anything to talk about there? Uh, no, I, I think it, it's the voices, but also the courage. Um, I'm the mother of two teenage daughters. Um, I guess one's almost out of teenage, going to be 21 this year. But um, the inspiration that I get from what they, what we all maybe accepted through the years in our generation, or accepted more than we should have, and this generation, my daughters, challenge things, and they have tremendous courage. Um, to take the leap, you know, to put themselves out there and be heard. And, uh, you know, I just, it continues to impress me and just be, be beyond, um, you know, comprehension. The other thing I think, too, is we find with a lot of these things going on in our, around us now, it's, if you don't have that courage, find someone to help you have that courage. I think there's also strength in numbers and power in numbers. And if you don't have that voice on your own, band together, and together you have that voice, which I think is the message as well. Yeah. So who's had a moment in your career where you 
either had that courage or you didn't have that courage and you <laughs> turned to somebody who sort of helped support you and made you believe that you could, you could do something? Well, we're sitting at this table. Everybody here has had yeah. to have courage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. They, they, they've climbed mountains. We've fired people. We've hired people. Right. We've taken on the challenge. This is an extraordinary group sitting up here. So I think for the young women out here who are in the workplace, you, you just have to understand who you are, know your capabilities, challenge yourself, mm -hmm. and have high standards and ha high goals. And people always ask me, well, what about this thing called balance? What are, <laughs> how are we going to do it all? <laughs> I interviewed Jack Welch once, and he has salty language. And Jack Welch said, he didn't disappoint me. I knew that about him. I'd worked with him in Connecticut, too. And Jack Welch said, what the fuck is balance? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said, my boss told me on Monday I needed to be in Germany on Wednesday, and I was in Germany on Wednesday. So you have to decide women, there are a few men here, but you have to decide. Do you want to be a little fish in a big pond? Do you want to be a big fish in a little pond? Or what my credo is, you want to own the pond. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Marian. <laughs> so Marian, you mentioned balance, and I was thinking that that has to do with how we walked on here in our spike heels. That's the new kind of balance. You know, it's just keeping yourself together. On the courage question, Karen, which is a really great question, I don't identify with having courage because you just do what's in front of you. And you don't think of it as something formidable. It's only all those voices of negativity that are trying to say to you, oh, that's impossible. You just don't listen to them. Yep. You have to learn to shut them out and just go ahead and do what you know you're capable of doing. And that doesn't feel very courageous. It's just doing your job. That's right. But sometimes the negativity comes from within you. Right. We yeah. heard the artists at the, who opened the show, who I thought were just amazing, both the singer and the filmmaker. And a lot of what they battled was within themselves. Right? Every day they woke up and said, I don't know if I can do it. And as a person who's gone through um, a relatively epic corporate meltdown recently. Um, <laughs> I didn't know I if remember, we were going to talk about that, Kim. I'm going yeah. to. You know why? Because uh, my board members would call me and say, do you want to quit? And I said, I want to quit every single night. But I wake up every single morning, and I know that there's 25,000 people who are depending on me to move forward. And so you will have those moments of up and down. And if you just got through and know that this is just what's in front of me, you can yeah. do it. I think the courage piece is really important as well and that you have to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You can't listen to other people. And I right. remember I had uh, two children and I can remember my boss saying to me, you know, if you have any more kids, this is going to impact your career. And I thought, you know, but doesn't even make sense to me. So, you know, you have to have the courage to do what you wanted to do. And three months later, I was pregnant with number three, despite <laughs> that guy. Um, by the way, she's got four. Yeah. So we're going to bow to Marianne, four. Um, well, I want to just, uh, um, just to follow up on that, um, you know, waking up each day, I, about a year ago, I guess just over a year ago, I was up for a role change within our firm, and it had been something I'd been working toward, and, um, you know, planning for and working for. I had the mentorship, the sponsorship, and it didn't work out. It didn't work out. Other things came into play. And you sort of wake up, you know, you get, the alarm goes off, and you're like, I think I'll just stay in the fetal position today. <laughs> because you, you, it, when you have a setback or something that you've been aspiring to or, you know, a career milestone that you sort of thought was this thing, um, and you learn all those things that people always tell you, but until you go through it yourself, you know, you just kind of brush people off. Well, one door closes, then they're open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one door I did close, another door did open. Mm. And again, as a mother of two teenage daughters, as I was trying to work through my disappointment and my frustration and, and some of the things that happened, um, I realized I have two young women watching their mother who would rather be in the fetal position in the, in the room. But you, so I think too, sometimes you, you hate to have that pressure that people are watching you, but here's the reality. As a woman, particularly in the corporate world, people are watching you. And particularly when you're a woman, there is a very fine microscope on what you're doing, what you're saying, how you look. And, and I think I, one of the lessons if I could tell my younger self is, you know, who cares? I mean, you, you do learn to, to not, you know, to disregard that, but it's hard. It's hard when you're trying to do that thing, stay focused, you know, just keep moving 
and that stuff just gets in your way. It just gets in your way. So you have to kind of, again, stay focused, but also know that to all of us, we have those moments, and somehow we help each other power through it, and we move yeah. forward. But you're not alone. You don't have to be alone. Right. Um, you know, we talk about sponsors, mentors, networks, et cetera. And then at home, this is, I have to get this in somehow, so I'm <laughs> sneaking it in, that um, it's still true that women, one of the things that interferes with women getting power and influence is that women still disproportionately carry household responsibilities. We haven't cracked that yet, except if you have enough courage and a sense of empowerment, you tell them they'd better do it. So I, the, I was <laughs> speaking at a conference, um, and Sheryl Sandberg told me this is one of her favorite lines in Leaning In, and the conference was called What Men Can Do for Women's Leadership, yeah. and I said, the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> um, She says that laundry is the sexiest thing men can do for women, which is exactly... Um, you know, because we can take care of ourselves. I mean, it, we don't necessarily need people to say, okay, now you're anointed, you're a leader. We need people to do some of the work, to be by our side, to be partners, so that we can then do the things like you're doing, standing up and saying, I'm responsible for 25,000 people. That's a big responsibility. It is. It matters every single day. It matters every day. One of the things that I, I think about is, and that was transformative for me, is you will go through some very difficult times as well as those amazing times of elation. Um, and what you can do for each other is to be available to somebody. It's easy when you get the big job and everybody wants to call and say congratulations. Be the first person to call that person who didn't get the job they wanted, mm -hmm. who got fired for right or for wrong. Those are the times when you will really show your courage and your leadership, is to be available. Because people feel so alone when they go through that really ugly time. I saved all those texts of people who gave me encouragement. And I, and I say to folks, the one thing you do is answer your phone because nobody wants to return the call of the person who's just asking for something. So if you can be that person, that loyalty will come back to you over and over and over again, and people will appreciate it, even if they don't tell you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I wanna to switch topics. I wanna to talk about ambition. So it's 2018. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of amazed that women are still a little bit conflicted about how much ambition they should have or how much ambition they should show. And we, Hill Holiday, we just did a study um, uh, specifically of single women. And women are conflicted about showing ambition in both professional and social situations, um, particularly single women. I'm looking at Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so what do, you, what do you think about ambition and women showing ambition and not sort of self-editing and hiding their ambition? All, all of you. Were, were you going to say something as a single Well, woman? I was thinking about it, and I wanted to know what your study found yeah. about how ambition gets recharacterized when it's applied to a woman, right. how aggressiveness gets recharacterized when it's right. applied to a woman. So there were, um, so not to get to, I could spend the whole rest Where's that little countdown clock? Yeah. <laughs> Where's the countdown clock? Oh, wait, oh. Um, So there are different characteristics that women were asked what characteristics are attractive in men, and men were asked what characteristics are attractive in women, and they don't match up. And ambition is one that's really high on women's list in men, but it is very low on men's list in women, which is sort of amazing to me given where we are. It's not the 50s. Yeah. And to Roosevelt's point about men having to share responsibility. So I was going to say that there was a study done at Harvard Business School that showed, because about women participating in class, speaking up, because half their grade is determined by speaking up in class, participating, and that the married women participated as much as the men, but the single women, because they were at an age where the marriage market and the dating market, and maybe they were beginning to feel that they would be left behind, 
did not speak enough. So I talk to them a lot and say, first of all, you only need one guy, you know, so, or woman, <laughs> dep woman depending on your preferences. Um, but that was really striking. Yeah. So we just have to work a little harder about that. And we have to show the attractiveness of accomplished women. And increasingly, I'm actually, having been around for a long time, I'm excited about the number of women in positions of power who are incredibly attractive. Not that that should matter. Thank you, Rosabeth. <laughs> <laughs> But friends of a long time. Thank yeah, you. yeah, but but that um, that it's really okay, and and but that does get in the way a little bit of women showing everything they can do, if they're still feeling they're in a in a dating market. So so we have to help, give a little nudge, and we have to show how appealing, because there are some guys. My son. I don't know if I really should say this publicly. It may get back to him. But you're but gonna. He, he once said to me, you know, Mom, I couldn't date a woman who doesn't have an advanced degree. There you go. How cool was that? You're a good mama. Yeah. Well, I you mean. The, you set the tone. Well, I have two sons. And those of you who remember when Lee Iacocca was running Chrysler. No, we're not old enough. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're so well read. <laughs> Our younger son came home, he was, they, they went to a boys Jesuit school and he came home and he says, Ma, you know, Father so-and-so said that um, he, he couldn't imagine a woman r running Chrysler with all the problems they have to solve. And I looked at him and I guess my stare must have really <laughs> withered him. But not you, Ma, not you. Those, those other moms, those other moms. And I said, what is it that you think I do? <laughs> and, and so he kind of stammered a little and all, and I said, let me tell you this. I can bring in here to this house 12 women who do what I do. And I can bring 20 women who own companies like I do. And don't you forget that we are as smart or smarter than any man walking with two feet. Any man. And, and with sons, I told them. I said, any woman who wants to be like a man lacks ambition. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't want to be like him, because we know we work harder, we work smarter, and we can exceed anything he's going to do or try to do. So the women here need to understand, sit up straighter. I see some of you are slouching, you see? Yeah, just, just including this right. <laughs> Mary. You, you want to present your best face always because you never know who's watching. And don't be afraid to speak up. There are some men who want to take credit. There are some men who want to cut you off. Don't allow it to happen. Be your best self. Would you agree? Be your best self. The women up here are their best selves. Be your best self. I was going to say a lot about ambition is confidence as well. And how many people have looked at a job opportunity and looked at all the skills required and feel like they have to tick absolutely yeah. everything to say, yes, I have that, yes, I have that, yes, I have that. And then the man over here applies for the job and might have 50% of what they're looking for. Right. And I keep telling women that the whole idea of finding a new job and doing something different is to learn something. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have everything on that checklist. And you got to make sure that you have confidence in yourself to really get out there and put yourself out there and try something different and take a few risks. And you know, when it comes to ambition, my hugest compliment in my career is my children, actually. And when I got this job at uh, John Hancock as president and CEO, for them to say how proud they were of me and what I have accomplished and how much it means to them has meant the world to me as well. Yeah, I, I would say my same, very similar, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. My, um, when, you're, when you have kind of a career that, that uh, I had, my spouse worked as well, we both had full-time jobs, and you wonder, you know, we're not the Brady Bunch, we're not happy days, I know some of those shows are not 
you're too old for the people in this room, but um, we're, but we're not that, we're not a traditional house and, and we never were. And, and I would beat myself up for years about trying to manage my ambition and my aspiration with, of course, the joy that I have from raising my girls, our, our, our daughters. And I always wondered, um, what would they, what will they do at some point and where, how will this manifest itself? And, you know, um, my junior in college is a finance major, econ major, applying for internships in corporate America. Um, my youngest is going to be an accounting major um, at, at, at at also at Providence, my alma mater. So you have moments with your children where you're like, you know what, it, we actually, we, we did this okay, although we beat ourselves up. But one, one just comment on the confidence, and something I, I do share with my girls is, you know, we spend so much time building each other up and building ourselves up, and it's amazing the stuff that can chisel away. And you, you, ha you have to recognize what's chiseling at that, and, and box it out and find a way to not let it chisel at that, that confidence and that foundation. And years ago when I was a young partner, I was, had the privilege of being in a, a leadership program within the firm and I had to do this upward feedback process. And one of the partners that I was reporting up through at the time um, in, in, in the firm, he didn't know I knew he said this because it was supposed to be anonymous, but my coach at the time felt it was important I knew who said this, but his comment was very positive. Susan's this, this, this. And then he said, however, she's tall, blonde and over exuberant at times and needs to keep this in check or something to that. And I, as you can tell, it's, I mean, 12 years later, I'm still talking about this, but I was devastated and I thought it was the end of the world. And I mean, tall, whatever, what am I, what the, what am I supposed to do about that? Okay. Um, <laughs> the blonde, I mean, I do highlight my hair. It's a little too much at times, but whatever. It's good. It's that. Thank you. It looks and, good. So, you know, we're in the winter color now. And then, um, <laughs> and the over exuberant, okay. I mean, I, I often described as, you know, with air quotes, Susan's energy. Um, and, and a couple of things helped me not get past that, but it became a tool for the rest of, um, for the rest of my career. One was, again, this, my coach worked with me about, again, how to sort of put that in its place and not let that, you know, kind of take over all, you know, the voices, right? But I would also tell you, I was incredibly, um, I will say, incredibly blessed to have um, a, a handful of sponsors and mentors in my firm, and by the way, who were men, who were instrumental in helping me see how they, they said to me, and then they couldn't understand, they said, why are you letting this define you? Why are you letting this? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? You know, and, and they were so, so critical and instrumental in helping me work past maybe some things that I, you know, my own demons, um, and moving past it and having that strength and that courage. So, you know, shout out to, to the men in the audience. For those of you who are sponsors and mentors, um, women need sponsors and mentors who are both men and women. They need all types, um, all colors, all anything. And um, those are the people that help work you through and help keep you, you know, keep you up when you're ready to let that stuff kind of chisel away at that confidence. I have to say, yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with being tall, blonde, and over exuberant. Over exuberant. I would say you should see some of the feedback I got in my career. <laughs> but there was a time when I got feedback. It's a little tricky because everybody knows I've only worked for one company. But I've worked for a lot of different people over the years. I got feedback that was a little bit like change your change, like yes. sort of change yes. what you are. And I took it in because I love feedback and I thought about it and I processed it and I asked some people I trust for help. And at the end of the day, it was actually literally at the end of a year, I really thought carefully about it and I tried different things. At the end of a year, I said, you know what? I am what I am in terms of my personality, my core values, what motivates me. Now, skills, mindset, those things can all change and evolve, but I think you've got to embrace what you are, your authentic self, yep. because all the energy that you have can sometimes be expended trying to change the way you are to please somebody else or somebody else's de de definition of what you should be. And I think women, I think the default system in the business world is still male. And so women who try to act like guys or dress like guys or sound like guys, I've heard women say you should moderate your voice so it's a lot lower so you sound like a guy. I mean, you could spend all your time and energy just doing that. Rosabeth, you look like you want to do I, I want to say something because, Karen, now that you're CEO and you've been CEO for a while, everybody wants to have long blonde hair and be exuberant. <laughs> I mean, a lot of this, and Susan, same deal. I mean, a lot of this is who has the power. People want to model themselves mm -hmm. after the people in power. Mm -hmm. And so there's plenty of room, and suddenly the style 
changes. I think people love energy. I think people love the sense of commitment to other yep. people. I think people love people who want to help people. Mm -hmm. yep. And by the way, if I can sneak in one more internet and social media comment, as long as I have the floor. Um, one of the ways to make oneself feel better when a little down or feeling maybe there was a negative comment is to send an email to somebody else that you know has it even worse because everybody has something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it isn't because your thing isn't as bad as their thing. It's because of that great feeling you can give to somebody else. And once you do that, that's the best way to gain confidence. By the way, I wrote a book called yes. Confidence. That's <laughs> the best way to gain confidence is to do something for somebody else because then they're grateful to you. Then you feel that you can be, you can have efficacy. The worst thing is to not have efficacy. The worst thing is to get depressed and not do anything. You just have to do. Yep. All right, well, that was a lot going from yeah. your energy and exuberance, <laughs> Susan and um, Karen. We're not, I, I don't know if I said it out here or I said it backstage. We're not worrying about segues up here. We're yeah. zigging and we're zagging. Yeah. And, um, so talk, who can, who's got sort of a personal turning point in their life where, I mean, Susan kind of shared her story and, yeah. you know, Marianne when it was time to have another child and who's, you know, who's got a moment that they want to share that was really a turning point for them? Well, I can share. I was um, I was in public accounting actually for 12 years, and uh, yeah, she's <laughs> yeah. excited about that. I'll tell you my story, okay. my turning point. And I said I wanted to be in public accounting forever. Like I really liked it, and I wanted to be a partner. And I can remember we were we moving so that I could further my career, and I was really excited about that. Bought a house, all ready to move two hours into Toronto, and. Um, it was one month before we were moving, and my local client asked me if I wanted to come and work for them. And I said, oh, I'm very flattered, but thank you very much. I've already actually, I'd already started working in Toronto, so I had already uh, done that. So I went home that night, and I said to my husband, I said, you'll not believe it, but I was just offered a job. And he said, oh, thank God, I didn't want to move. <laughs> and I said, what? I said, you weren't going to tell me? And he wasn't actually oh. going to tell me oh, my God. that he didn't want to make the move. Um, and so, of course, just like that, my entire career changed right in front of me. And I went in and I resigned from public accounting and joined my client. And I would never change anything that I've done since then. So it's, you know, uh, it was a major turning point, but something that told me you can't plan everything out yeah. because if you yeah. do, you will miss great opportunities. Mm -hmm. And ever since that, I didn't plan out my career at all. And I sort of waited to see what was coming and what, what came my way. And I didn't hesitate to say, sure, I'll try it. You know, I'll, something different, I'll try it. Moving down to the U.S. was a big change when you have four kids and the eldest was going into his senior grade in uh, high school. Not an easy time to move people. But, you know, you, you learn to take more risks and you have a lot more fun doing it, actually. It kind of worked out. Yeah, yeah, kind of worked, worked out. out. Huh? Well. It did yeah. work. My motto really is to look at every opportunity, and I've really been lucky in my career. I've never had a resume. I've only been recruited from one position to the next. The call comes, and I sit and chat with people. And I've gotten smarter over the years. The last four positions, I only moved because I had a contract, an ironclad contract. If I didn't like them or they didn't like me, a lot of cash was going to change hands. <laughs> <laughs> Go marry. And, and you get smarter because you sit and you think, if they want me because of that, then let me tell them what I want because of that. And as I said to one of the last offers, we didn't just have positions, jobs in Connecticut. We had a life. And I wasn't giving up a job or a position. My husband and I would be giving up a life. And so the life for the next position had to be just as good, if not really better, than the life we had. And as I was interviewed, my then and future board chairman said, what, what will it take to get you here? I had a Gulf Stream. Right. And they offered a Falcon, so that was a nice <laughs> starter. <laughs> and I said, well, 
I like sports. And he said, I have four seats behind home plate at the Red Sox. And I said, well, we can continue the conversation. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm a baseball fan. And we go to the Red Sox games. And then the conversation turned to, what else do you want? And I said, I'm going to have a life. And women, you're going to have to fight for your life. You don't want to work 12, 15, 18 hours every day without going to have a life. So I made sure with our sons and now grandchildren, I say I have four grandchildren and two grand dogs. And they're all a part of our celebrations. But I want to tell you, we've talked about ambition, confidence, opportunities. And Marianne said it. You don't have to check off every box because you're going to learn. And if you're sitting in the seats where we have sat, you're going to hire that talent. You're going to fill in the blanks with smart minds. So if you have an opportunity to learn and work with other smart people, take it. I've taken some flyers. I've got a call to work with the President of the United States. Oh my gosh. He was of the other party. And I thought, well, maybe I don't want to do it. So at a lunch at the White House, he offered me the position. And I thought, well, let's see. And his deputy said, we will need you to publicly support his public positions on things. And I said, well, you really have the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home thinking I had a nice lunch, and I'll never hear from those people again. And in 48 hours, they called for me to come to the White House. Hold on to what you believe is important. Make sure you don't give up a core value of yours to please somebody else. It was not happening. It was not happening. I would have to echo that. It's not only to get a job, but to keep a job. Is every single day you have to wake up and be true to who you are and what you believe is right. And so there is no money, no title, right. no affiliation that's worth not being true to what you believe in every single day. Because it's hard. And so in order to put forth the effort and the commitment to keep on going, it has to be consistent with what you believe in. And so it, it work with people who you care about, work with people who you, who you admire, work with people who you want to be with, and then it gets easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, my, if we're going around and we're all talking about turning points, I actually can't think about turning points because I'm still looking for it. <laughs> um, and that is looking ahead, never giving up. There's always opportunities. Mm -hmm. There's opportunities in every situation. And I don't focus a lot on the past. If you ask me a lot of history questions, I don't have it. And I've actually had people from around the world, students who will write me and say, I'm writing a paper on you, and I can't find really any personal information. I say, yes. <laughs> you know, like this is sort of post-Facebook, but it's a thing we really should all do, is really be careful about what we put out there for people to find. But I don't identify that much with history. I identify with what's in front of us to do now, and Where's there a problem? Where's there an opportunity? And I actually think that's good, regardless of what one's career is, you've got to be looking for the bigger impact. I just did a TEDx talk talking about the only three career steps that matter, and I said inclusion, getting in the door, influence, getting at the table, and impact, getting outside the building. I mean, changing the structure, finding something bigger to do, so while I think it can be very useful to people to hear about how any of us overcame obstacles, how all of you have overcome obstacles or done great things, I, I just think that looking ahead to finding what the next opportunity is is what keeps us healthy and happy. That the happiest people are the ones working on the most difficult problems. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, to, yeah. I've been doing a little introspection lately because Hill Holiday is going to celebrate our 50th anniversary in the middle of May this Ooh. year. Oh, yeah, thank you. There are the Hill Holiday tables. Karen, were you born in the office? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was born in the office. Yes. Um, 
I literally almost had my first child in the office, but that's a whole nother story. Um, but I've, because I've worked at the same company my whole career, I'm very careful about Rosabeth, always looking forward, always talking about the future, because I never want anyone to think within Hill Holiday that I'm trying to protect the past. Because if you try to protect the past, it is impossible to move forward. And so I completely agree with you. I used to think about myself in a bumper, visualize myself in a bumper car. And if I went, if I hit a wall, I would just back the bumper car up and go like two degrees that way. That didn't work, I'd go two degrees this way. There's always, always a path forward. And I appreciate all your, I've learned just from listening to, to all of you guys. I have no idea what's going on with that clock. Oh, 222. Okay. Can I do the one piece of advice? Anybody want to jump in? One piece of advice that we haven't already talked about for everybody in the room? My favorite, never give up. Good one. Good. Look for new opportunities and enjoy every day. My constant response is fabulous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I've heard that a million times. How are you, Marion? Fabulous. Absolutely See? fabulous. <laughs> How were you yesterday, Marion? Fabulous, but the next step after fabulous is euphoric, so I don't do well enough. <laughs> Take lots of risks. Yeah, I'd say to my girls, never give up, and also there is a solution to any problem you are facing. I tell my girls that, I believe it, and I, I think it's something you have to, to live by. I would say don't look back. Yeah. I'm with you on the forward thinking, because our organizations are changing every day, Going back to the beginning, when you think of those Parkland kids, I think of my own kids, and I think of how they approach problems, and how they are undaunted, and how they are ready to disrupt. And in the protectionist mode, you can hate that and say, we've got to protect what we have. Or you can say, let's break some glass, kids. Bleh. And I think that that's something that we've got to get comfortable with, because it's not innate. Well, it's not ours anymore, it's theirs, yeah. right? I Which is what we saw this weekend. That's right. The other thing is, Karen, show up and become good friends with Karen Kaplan. <laughs> because then you get to do fun, cool things like this. Well, I could not have asked for a better group on The View yeah. today. Thank you so much, ladies. Oh, thank you. Thank you.